What's up guys, Alexa here. In this video, we are doing a deep dive into stable diffusion model. And by the end of this video, you'll understand exactly how the training of both stages works, how the sampling works, how to generate images, etc., etc. Having said that, uh, a week ago, the weights for the stable diffusion models were published, uh, which is super exciting. So we know that since the beginning of this year, with the um, release of the uh, DALI 2 paper, we had a Cambrian explosion of various uh, image generation models, such as, uh, well, DALI 2, we had Mid Journey, we had Imagine, Party, we had DALI Mini, which is the open source implementation of DALI version 1. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why this model is so important is, well, there are multiple reasons. One of them is the images are super high quality. Uh, and additionally, you have much less constraints. So that means you can generate uh, images of human faces. You can also, because the code is open source, remove the safety features and generate whatever you want. Although I, do not, I, I don't encourage you definitely to share malicious images uh, across uh, internet, but if you want to experiment, you can do that as well. So that's kind of cool. Uh, additionally, and very importantly, you can run this model directly on your machine, even if you only have a, a, like a GPU that has eight gigabytes of, RAM, of VRAM. So I personally have RTX 2080 on my laptop, and I'm able to run this in Flow 16 without a problem and generate awesome images in a couple of seconds. So that's again, very cool. So it's much faster, it requires much less memory, and it has less constraints, and it's high quality. That's why stable diffusion is so, so uh, interesting. Okay, so I wanna showcase a couple of very cool examples that uh, some digital artists such as Xander here have been creating. You can see how cool these uh, these uh, videos are and they were created using stable diffusion. You can see the, the name of this piece is called Voyage Through Time and what Xander did, and you can kind of go through the video and I strongly encourage you to check out this video. It's amazing, it's really like mind blowing uh, like that we can create this on like literally consumer grade GPUs and, and yeah, in, and enjoy the this piece of work, piece of art. Okay, so here is uh, an example of um, the, the the prompts and the seeds that Xander had to create to generate this this cool video. So you can see there is a lot of like seed is being used as a hyperparameter. You have to tweak the seeds, you have to tweak the the, the the prompts, do some prompt engineering, and at the end you end up with something as cool as 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 this video. Okay, so I said I also managed to to run uh, this uh, stable diffusion on my GPU that has eight gigabytes of VRAM. I was generating using uh, Float 16 Precision, but you can see the images are super high quality as well. So uh, yeah, these, these, these images were generated using a prompt, a painting of an AI robot having an epiphany moment. Uh, and additionally, I'll, I'll basically um, release a script that I use to generate uh, some cool, um, like some cool uh, interpolation. So basically the idea is to, you, you pick, you generate a diverse set of images such as the set you, you've seen here, and you can pick two images you like, and then basically do interpolation between them in the latent space. Uh, of, of the model. So that was inspired by Karpathy's uh, gist. But yeah, I'm, I'm gonna share that, that script uh, very soon and also cover it in a different video. So you can see here how it looks like the interpolation between, basically I'm interpolating between this image here and this image here. And I'm gonna now show you how, how that procedure kind of looks like. So here is how, how the image is being morphed uh, as we are approaching the target image. And you can see there are some like uh, jumps uh, in the latent space, but all in all, let me kind of uh, move this faster, you can see how, how cool it is. Uh, and yeah, I'm gonna share the script a bit later. So having said that, uh, let's jump into the, um, uh, the code. And well, first, let's, let me show you some, some, some prerequisite knowledge here. Uh, I'll have three papers which I'll consult. I will not do deep dives of the papers in this video. So one of those papers is um, a Taming Transformers, uh, basically for high resolution image synthesis that introduced the VQGAN paper. Uh, I've previously covered that paper on my, on my YouTube channel, so do check it out if you wanna have a, a thorough, thorough understanding of how that works. Uh, I'm gonna consult some of the formulas later when I show you the code. Uh, next up, we have the high resolution image synthesis with latent diffusion models or LDMs. And that's the paper that's behind the stable diffusion model, basically. So LDMs is what's powering the stable diffusion. And finally, I'm gonna uh, briefly um, consult this paper, pseudo numerical methods for diffusion models on manifolds that introduced the PLMS. So the pseudo linear multi-step uh, scheduler that makes uh, stable diffusion fast and high quality. So you can literally have only 50 steps uh, of, of diffusion model and still generate very high quality 
images. Okay, so I'm gonna briefly walk you through through some ideas in this paper, like super briefly. Uh, and um, if you wanna learn more about diffusion models, I have a whole like a diffusion playlist. So do check it out. I've been doing both the paper overviews as well as, as, as code walkthroughs of the original repos. So do check those out if you wanna have a deeper understanding of how diffusion models work. Here I'm gonna do a, mostly a diff between what has changed compared to those older models. Okay, let's start here. So to enable, to enable diffusion model training on limited computational resources while retaining their quality and flexibility, we apply them in the latent space of powerful pre-trained autoencoders. So this is literally the main diff compared to all of the other papers. They train instead of, uh, of working in the image space and doing the forward diffusion process and then learning the reverse process in the image space, instead they do that in the latent space. Okay, let me just quickly show you the difference in the loss. So here it is. So here is the original, uh, basically, construction, how the original loss for the DDPM model looked like. You basically do, you, you sample uh, images here, you sample uh, noise from the from the normal distribution, you sample different time steps, and you literally just do MSC loss, so the mean squared error loss, uh, between uh, the, the, the noise and uh, what you predict. So this is, so epsilon, theta is modeled usually as a unit architecture, so using the unit architecture. And so what you do, you take the x of t, which is the original input image, plus t steps of diffusion being applied to it, so you kind of noise it, and then you pass this noisy version and the time step, uh, that's that. so basically the time step information, and then you need to, to predict the, the noise that was literally used to noise that image in the forward process, if that makes sense. So this is just a hopefully a recap for, for most of you. And then you just keep on repeating this until you train this unit to predict the noise. And then later you can just use it to denoise the, uh, well, uh, pure noise images such that you can generate cool images. Okay, so this is the only difference between LDMs, so that this paper and the previous work. They are literally just working in the um, latent space of this encoder. Uh, and uh, you can see everything else remains the same. So literally, the, the, the difference is the following. So instead of working in the image space, you're going to, um, whoops, you're going to have an, like an encoder that's going to train, being, is going to be trained using the VQ, similar to VQGAN paper. You end up, so, so you input the image, you, you end up with a latent here, and then everything else remains the same. You're now using this latent to, to train your diffusion models. So here is the uh, like a snippet from the DDPM paper. Uh, so now instead of using X of T, it will not be an image here. It will uh, uh, it will be uh, instead, sorry, X of zero will not be an, an image. It's gonna be instead uh, like a latent uh, representation of the image. And that's pretty much it, really. Really, th that's all there is to it. That's the only diff between this paper and uh, and the previous art. So. Here is how the how the uh, diagram looks like. So we will the code walkthrough will contain uh, the three three parts. The first part I'm going to show you how to train the autoencoder here. It's going to be the first part of the video. The second part I'm going to show you how to train the UNet, so diffusion model, such that uh, you can so you can see here we we first uh, end up in the latent space. Then we do the forward diffusion process such that we end up with z of t and then we diffuse it uh, we will learn how to predict the noise that was added during this diffusion process here we learn how to predict it as the output and uh, well that's it everything else is diffusion magic and uh, also we'll have i'm going to show you how, how they are using it the we'll also be learning the conditioning model so we'll mostly be focusing on text as well as classes from the image net data set Okay, that's it. And the third part of the video will be about uh, basically how to sample once we train uh, these models. If you didn't understand everything uh, because you lack some background, uh, feel free to continue watching this video. I think that the code will be fairly self-explanatory. Um, okay, so if you want to follow along uh, what I'm doing here, you'll have to do a couple of steps. Obviously, you'll have to clone the original repo, so the stable diffusion repo here. Just create the cond environment following the instructions here under the requirements section. Uh, and after that, go ahead and download uh, like such that we can have a minimal setup and just get something running. Uh, you don't have to, to download the, the original ImageNet dataset, which is huge. You can instead go to this uh, like FastAI's ImageNet 
however you pronounce this thing, uh, like a GitHub repo and download the smallest version possible. So literally 160 pixels, it's gonna download only 10 classes from ImageNet and it's gonna make us, uh, well, uh, set up for, 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 for the training procedure. Um, basically this older repo, latent diffusion, which preceded their stable diffusion repo, which I'm gonna also link in the video description, contains the necessary uh, instructions for how you can unpack uh, the data set and where you need to place it such that the script uh, can can recognize and the data can be loaded. Uh, okay guys, so let me jump now into the actual code. Here we are, uh, a couple more things we need to sort out. So first of all, obviously we need to set some input arguments. There is only a couple of them that we care about. First one is we want to pass the uh, like the the, 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 the the configuration file for the autoencoder. So first we're going to train the autoencoder. Uh, and uh, then you need to pass the T flag, meaning we want to train it, and then GPUs. So I'm passing zero, uh, comma, because I only have a single GPU and the index of that GPU is zero. If you have multiple GPUs, feel free to uh, add one, two, three, whatever, how many uh, GPUs you have there. Uh, okay, final thing, because this is a research code base after all, uh, there are some bugs, and so I had to kind of sort them out before getting this to work on a Windows machine. Okay, so let me open up my, my diff tool here. So I just have to do this, get diff tool D, and I'm gonna open up uh, the differences that, uh, the, to the code I made. So first of all, um, this is not a bug. Uh, this is just like a small modifications you have to do if you wanna train this on a single GPU, if you wanna be able to do a walkthrough on a, on a uh, VRAM limited system. So basically uh, set batch size to one instead of default 12, otherwise you'll get CUDA um, out of memory exceptions. That's the first week you have to do. The second one is actually a bug. So you have to go to data, ImageNet file. Uh, I mean, it's a bug if you're on Windows. So the thing is they kind of hard coded the slash here, assuming that that's how you split the path on an arbitrary system, which is not the case for Windows. So it's much better to use os.sap, which is gonna resolve automatically depending on the uh, operating system into the correct uh, character sequence. For Windows, it's gonna be double backslash. And so this now works. Otherwise, you'll have some errors and the, 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 the training will not work. Okay, and the final tweak is in the main script. So if we go here to the main script, you can see I had to make a couple of changes. First of all, I had to set the number of workers to zero because otherwise I was again getting some, some, some errors. Um, that's one tweak. The second tweak is set the shuffle to false here uh, for the uh, train data loader. The reason being is uh, we are using, if you recall, we're using that super small uh, subsample of the image net. And so if you just keep, sh if you just do the shuffling, it might happen that you take some super big index and try to index into our data set and we don't have that image. And then you're gonna get, have the, uh, well, index out of range exception or something. Okay, so that's the second week I had to do. Um, the third week is comment on the DDP in case you only have a single GPU. So that's the distributed data parallel uh, like a object from, from PyTorch. Uh, I don't need that, so I had to comment it out. And finally, I had to comment out the signal parts because that does not work on Windows and I didn't wanna bother uh, figuring out how to fix it on Windows because I'm just wanna, I just wanna do a walkthrough and explain you guys how this training procedure looks like. That's it. We are ready, let's get into the code. I'm gonna uh, start in the main file. So main file is the is where the training magic happens. So let me go to the main function here. Okay, so here we are. I'm gonna set the breakpoint here and uh, let's start debugging this thing. Okay, so just hit the training. We're gonna use the information we passed in our launch JSON if you're using VS Code. If not, you just need to pass those arguments somehow. Here we are. And again, I'm gonna focus only, only on, on important parts. So I'm gonna skim everything else. Like we're just doing some parsing, uh, blah, blah, blah. We, we, we can skip literally everything. We're just creating some directories, doing some configurations. So I'm gonna skip here. This is a salient point. So here we are doing the like loading from the config file. So let me show you briefly how the config file looks like. So if you go here, if you find the configs directory and then you find under the autoencoder, you'll find the one we're using. So that's this one. And you can see everything you need to uh, instantiate various sub modules of the, of the LDM is here. So we have the autoencoder here. We have the loss we are using. We'll see what this is. It's basically a perceptual loss and the parameters we use to construct that loss. 
we have uh, information to specify such that we can uh, construct our data loaders, uh, some callbacks for PyTorch Lightning, which is the framework they are using, which is built on top of PyTorch, if you never heard of it. And that's it, like some information about um, accumulating radiant, uh, nothing, nothing important. Let's go back to the um, basically main function. That's all uh, you need to see. Okay, now I'm gonna keep skipping all of this, accelerators, GPUs, nothing fancy. I'm gonna skip all the way here to a model. So that's where we instantiate the actual model. Okay, so we, you can see here, we're gonna now construct the autoencoder KL. So uh, let me just see whether I've enabled all of the breakpoints. And if so, let me do F10 and I'm gonna hit the init function of the autoencoder. Okay, couple of steps here. We, because it's an autoencoder, obviously we have to instantiate first the encoder and then decoder. So let's see how those look like. Um, basically, let me just see what this DD config is, but I'm fairly, yeah, okay. So it just contains the, the necessary parameters to construct the encoder. Okay, so let's let's go into the encoder. Uh, encoder, nothing, nothing really fundamental, um, basically, bunch of com layers, a uh, bunch of, um, there, there are some interesting attention layers, which what basically what I do is in the latent space of the encoder, so you, they take the uh, image features and they just do the VAT type of uh, uh, like a self attention. So you, kinda, you can kind of unroll them and then just do simple um, uh, like a self attention uh, logic where every token attends to every other token. That's it, and then there are some downsampling layers, uh, which are again just uh, a combination. Like basically, you can see here, it's just a com, uh, like a layer with a stride of two, whatnot. That's it. Uh, I'm gonna jump over all of these again. Just a simple uh, encoder model. Nothing, nothing fancy there. Okay, let's continue. Let's exit this part, and now let's enter the decoder. Similar story. Um, nothing fundamental to understand here. Bunch of com layers, bunch of res blocks, and then there is some upsampling. I'm gonna hit F5. Let's exit this model. That's it. The architecture is not the interesting part of this of training the autoencoder. Um, okay, now this is the interesting part. Here is where we instantiate this. LPIPS with discriminator loss. It's a mouthful. It's basically a perceptual loss combined with adversarial loss. So let's step into it. Okay, so here it is. Here we construct it again. I'm gonna focus only on the important parts. We have some loss coefficients. So depending on which component of the loss we are looking at, we'll have a different weight. Uh, but most of all, let me, let me show you this. So if you're not familiar with this perceptual loss concept, I think it has been introduced at least since the neural style transfer papers. So that was the, those were the, were the first papers I saw were using the perceptual loss. So, so the idea is to basically, let me step into it, to basically uh, take a pre-trained VGG16 network and uh, then pass your image uh, and grab some in representation, intermediate representation from the VGG16 network, and then basically do MSC in the latent space, in that representation space, instead of in the image space. And by doing that, you can kind of compare uh, like the semantics of, of your input images and not, not like focus on, on some maybe superficial uh, noisy details in the image space. That's the basic idea. Uh, additionally, there are these net lean layers, which what they do is they reduce the number of channels from let's say 64 to one, and then you can kind of collapse them and do the loss logic. We'll see in a couple of minutes what that exactly means once we start doing the actual forward prop through the models. Now we're just instantiating so this is enough for you to understand. So we are loading the model here, and then we literally grab uh, the pre-trained model uh, from the uh, taming, so this is their older repo, so taming transformers, that, which introduced the VQ GAM paper, and they basically have a checkpoint there of the, of the, that, that's going to initialize this LPIPS uh, loss. Okay, so let me just kinda go and do that, and you can see here, loaded pre-trained loss, from this file here, VGG PTH. Okay, so now what happens is we just set gradients to false everywhere and uh, that's pretty much it. So let me now hit F5 and we are out of that function. Okay, now the second interesting part is discriminator. So that's gonna be used in the uh, adversarial uh, loss component of the final loss. Uh, again, um, I'm not sure it's worth even digging through it, but it's literally just a bunch of, uh, um, you can see here, so there is some batch norm going on, 
com layers, leaky rail use, com, com layers, leaky rail use, nothing fundamental there. I'm just gonna skip over it. it and it's again going to downsample because this is a patch based um, discriminator. You can kind of check, you can see here, that's the patch can discriminator that was uh, first described in the pix to pix paper. Uh, you can check out this link if you, if you want to check it out. But the main difference is instead of having a scalar and then say, scalar telling you whether this image is real or, or, or fake, which GAN networks do, GAN discriminators do, here you'll instead have literally for a patch, you'll have maybe 32 by 32 uh, scalars and all of those will, will tell you, so a particular uh, scalar will tell you whether that patch is real or fake. And that just kind of gives you more information to train, uh, so more information for, for, for your model to train. That's it. Okay, let's exit the discriminator. Uh, again, we have some uh, hinge loss. We'll see how that comes into, into play a bit later. We have this uh, weights again. Okay, we'll see all of that a bit later. That's it. Now we define some more com layers, uh, blah, 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 nothing fancy. Uh, monitor just tells us which loss are we monitoring. And in this case, validation reconstruction loss is something we care about. Okay, that's it. Now I'm gonna skip again, weights and biases, uh, logging, uh, blah, blah, blah. There is some model checkpointing. We don't care about model checkpointing in this logic. There is, as you can see, it's kind of fairly, uh, well, researchy code base some set callbacks, logging images, learning rates, blah, 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 CUDA callbacks, nothing, nothing fundamental for our understanding of how the, how the stable diffusion is trained. So I'm gonna skip all of that until, until I guess, until the data part, okay? So I'm gonna skip until the data part. So this is where we load the image net data. And again, uh, if you've set, if you downloaded the, uh, the, the image net, N-E-T-T-E -E data set, uh, and you've placed it into the correct directory, then everything is gonna work as expected here, plus the minor tweak I made with the OS separator, if you, if you recall that uh, from a couple of minutes ago. Okay, so again, I'm gonna ignore uh, all of this because it's just gonna prepare the data, nothing, nothing um, fancy there. So I'm gonna do this and click F5 and wait for our data to be loaded. You can see there is some filtering going on, blah, 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 and we have the data ready. Okay, so that's it. We have, you can see here, train data and validation data. You can see the numbers are super, super big, uh, and that's definitely not the number of images we have in our small image net, and that's the reason why you have to set a shuffle to false, otherwise you'll, you'll get the index out of range exception. Uh, again, this is just what is needed what is needed to get a minimal setup up and running. If you actually want to train this, then obviously you want to have a full image net, you want to have multiple GPUs, etc., etc. But if you just want to step through and understand what's going on, this is more than enough. Okay, again, I'm going to skip across all of these parts. Not too interesting, checkpointing, blah, 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 debugging, uh, signals. I'm going to uh, enable breakpoint here, hit F5, and this is where the magic will start going on. So. I'm gonna now enable all of the breakpoints and let's start digging into this code. Okay, so F10, we end up in this on pre-trained routine start. So that's again, uh, something that PyTorch Lightning uh, defines for you. Um, PyTorch Lightning is very cool if you're a researcher and you're doing something that's fairly, has a fairly common structure in the sense that you don't have to think about zeroing your gradients, you don't have to think about calling the optimizer step, you don't have to think about all, all of those details. You just have to define a couple functions that the um, PyTorch Lightning API uh, requires you to and then everything kind of works out of the box uh, automatically. Okay. Um, this part is not uh, in interesting. We're just creating some directories for configs and logging, nothing nothing interesting really. And finally, we hit the validation data loader. Now you may be confused. Why are we starting with validation? How does that make sense? And that's again, PyTorch Lightning uh, detail. Um, what the framework does, and I think this is fairly brilliant, is it first literally loads only one or two batches of data uh, in the validation loop just to make sure that the validation works so that you don't have to waste a bunch of time in the training loop only to find out that your validation loop is broken and then you have to start from scratch. So instead of what they do is literally just verify that validation works and after that you resume the actual training and then validation. Everything else remains according to the usual um, sequence. Okay, so because of that, I'm going to disable all of the breakpoints here just enable the one in the train loader, hit F5, 
and wait until this uh, validation data set uh, basically check is, is, is completed. Here it is. Um, we can see we are hitting the uh, train data loader. Again, that's something that PyTorch Lightning requires you to define. Uh, let's continue here. And uh, let me just see whether I've enabled all the breakpoints. Okay, so now we're going to first, okay, again, some, some, some PyTorch Lightning stuff. Okay, so here we are. So what, now what's happening is we're loading the data from our training data set. And uh, here we are, we end up with this example We've done some pre-processing. You can see here we fetch the image, blah, blah, blah. And we end up with example, which is a dictionary that has multiple keys. So image and other ImageNet uh, idiosyncratic uh, like uh, keys. So let me show you some of those. So example image is obviously our input image. So it's processed such that we have 256, 256 and three channels. We also have, if I do example, uh, let's say class label, whoops. I need to make it a string. So class label, it's gonna be, uh, as you can see, label zero. So uh, our data set only has 10 labels. We are not using the full image net. That's why zero is high, highly probable. Uh, then let me show you one more human label, obviously just a human readable label of this uh, image net class. So Tinka, Tinka, whatever that is, and that's it, okay. And this is where it starts getting interesting. So, so here we are, we have a batch that was provided to us by, by PyTorch Lightning. Again, we have image in there. The shape is familiar, 256, 256. And now we, we do this uh, get input. It's just going to fetch the image, do some permutation, make sure that the memory is contiguous, blah, blah, blah. And now we're doing self and we pass inputs. So this is a fancy way of saying, call the forward method of this class. And let's see, so we are dealing with we're dealing with auto encoders here, obviously. And uh, the forward class is here. So let me just do F10 and we hit this part. So first part is obviously we do the encoding and then we do the sampling and do, then we do the decoding, okay? Um, so let's dig into the decoder. Here it is. Here is the decoding logic, some down sampling, blah, blah, blah. Again, I'm gonna skip everything here because as I already told you, encoder logic is fairly simple. We just do a forward pass through it and we end up with a latent space representation. Okay, so let's see what's the dimensionality of this uh, representation. You can see it's 6, 64, 64. And we expected three because if you recall, let me, let me show you the, well, we, will, we are using such a config where we expect 64, 64, three. Uh, six is there because we are actually returning the mean and the standard uh, the deviation or the variance uh, here. Uh, and uh, then we are sampling before we pass that sample to the decoder. So that's just a detail uh, worth mentioning. They did experiment with different types of uh, autoencoders. One of them we are currently working with is the KL regularized autoencoder. They were also playing with quantized versions, but we really don't care about all of those details. There is just too, too many things going on. Okay, some processing of that representation, we end up with moments. When, when they say moment, they literally mean zeroth and first moment, like so the mean and the, and the, and the variance. So now we pass uh, that into this diagonal Gaussian distribution. So we're gonna basically form a distribution here. We're gonna name it posterior. So let me kind of enter there. You can see we just uh, chunk, we just split into two parts. Uh, that representation and we end up with mean and log variance. So that's what we are actually returning. And then some clamping, exponentiation, such that we end up with standard deviation, variance, and that's it. Okay, just a Gaussian, that's all. Um, after that, we uh, have to sample. And sampling is simply, because Gaussians are such a, such a nice mathematical object, you basically just have to take the mean and add to it standard deviation multiplied by the normal noise from the normal Gaussian. That's it. Okay, and we end up with a representation. So now let's see, Z should now have three channels, I guess. So three, 64, 64, as expected. Okay, so now let's pass this into the decoder stage. Here we are, we do some processing, just a conv layer. Uh, decoder, what it does is, again, just up sampling, conv, attention, again, trivial stuff. I'm gonna skip over that. That's kind of um, common knowledge. Okay, so we end up with Output, output should be because this is an autoencoder, should have the same shape as the input image. So that's 256, 256, 3. Let's just print out the shape so that we are, yeah, okay. 
we can we can see here that the uh, shape is as expected. Let's continue. We now return that decoded output and we return the posterior object, uh, which is the Gaussian, and that's this part. Okay, so now you'll see there are um, two if statements here. One is when the optimizer index is zero, and the other one is when the optimizer index is one. The reason we have uh, those parameters is because we have two different optimizers. Let me just see whether where is that function. So configure optimizers, I, I didn't show you this one, so we didn't step into it. But simply, uh, simply put, we have two optimizers. One is Adam, and that Adam is going to be optimizing encoders and decoders here. And the second optimizer is going to be uh, optimizing the discriminator weights. So we saw that when we instantiated the, the discriminator, I told you that it's going to be trainable. And here, the other optimizer cares about updating discriminator weights, whereas this can be treated as a generator. So the autoencoder part is the generator. The discriminator is obviously discriminator. And <laughs> that's, that's it. Okay. So let's go back here. So PyTorch Lightning makes it easy for us to do this type of a GAN um, loss computation. So first we'll step into this branch and then it will literally return call the training step again with optimizer index set to one and then we'll train the discriminator. So that's everything is kind of handled for us by the framework. Okay, this is where the whole brain of this autoencoder training is going to happen. So let's dig into this code. This is very important. Uh, okay, so we get the last layer that's going to be used for some lambda cal calculation. You'll see that in a second. So here we are, we are inside of the loss. Let's see how the loss looks like for the other encoder. So first of all, we have the reconstruction loss. It's simply, as you can see here, we subtract the inputs, which are the inputs image. So let's me, let me just kind of uh, make sure that this is NumPy or PyTorch tensor, I guess. Yeah, and then let's just see the shape. The shape should be uh, 256, yeah, everything's fine there. We have reconstructions. We literally just subtract them. And we obviously want to make this difference as small as possible. So that makes a lot of sense. We're just doing simple image space, um, like MSC type of a loss. Okay, now we have perceptual loss. This is the interesting part. So we pass the inputs and the reconstructions again. But this time we do not compare them in the image space. Instead, we compare them in the latent space of the VGG of the pre-trained VGG network. So let me show you that thing as well. Okay, so here we are. So we are again in this LPIPS uh, loss um, and we are in the forward step. So first thing they do is they have the scaling layer and that scaling is just going to subtract some mean and so let me just find that for a second. So scaling layer is here. So literally there's some shift and scale. Um, so uh, computations going on. I'm not sure whether this is from ImageNet statistics or not. Like, if somebody knows, let me know. I think this is from ImageNet, uh, and uh, that will make sense since we are now using ImageNet dataset as well. So that will make sense. We just kind of normalize our input tensors, and then we pass them through the VGG. Uh, and so you can see here what the VGG forward passing uh, in, in, uh, entails. So literally, we're going to return some intermediate representations, and we're going to wrap those up into this named tuple object and return it back. So let me hit F10. We are here. We're going to return all of that. We're going to hit it again because we have two computations, both for the input as well as, well as for the uh, reconstruction. Now we kind of uh, cluster all of these uh, layers that are going to reduce the number of channels together, just some syntactic sugar. And finally, let's see, here is where the magic is happening. So what we do is we normalize the tensor. Normal is just gonna basically divide it by the L2 norm. Okay, and then we do, as you can see here, again, we just do, uh, we, do we, we subtract them and we do the square. So it's a MSC loss without the M part because we're not doing the mean part yet. We're just doing this. And we repeat that for all of the representations because we will have like five representations from the VGG. So that's why we'll have five iterations of this loop. And now we're going to break out of it. And now we are here. Okay, so now what happens is we are going to pass those differences into these layers that are going to reduce the number of channels. So let me let me let me let me explain what I mean by that. So here here is this stiff. So here is the difference in the that, that we that we've done among the features. And the shape is going to be what? So here's the shape. After we apply this layer, 
So after we apply this, we'll just end up with a single channel. So if I put zero here, and if I put zero here, and if I just do the shape, you can see we have one, one, 256, 256. Okay, so that's the sole purpose of this, of this layer. And finally, we do the special, spatial average, which is simply a mean, a mean across dimensions. And so we end up with a scalar here. And that's it. That's, that's how the perceptual loss looks like. It's fairly simple. Uh, and I'm going to just keep on stepping over five times there. And then I'm going to hit the five. And that's it. So now we, we end up with uh, this, this array of, um, well, it's actually, yeah, we've accumulated, we've up aggregated the values here by doing a sum operator. And we end up with a single number. And that's the perceptual loss. That's it, guys. Um, the only part that's kind of new here for me personally are these uh, layers. You could as well skip that part and simply do uh, like a mean operation across these differences. So just MSC loss uh, directly in the feature space and that's it. But this is some type of a modification. I'm not sure why and whether there are some ablations, but okay. That's the perceptual loss. Okay. Finally, we've, we formed the, the, the reconstruction loss as a, as a weighted sum of the reconstruction loss from the image space. Plus, we, we grab the perceptual loss here and we have some weights, 1.0 here. Okay. So they are equally weighted. Okay. Next up, since this is zero, this is going to be zero. Let me just kind of double check. And because of that, exponent raised to the power of zero is one. So it's just going to be a neutral operation. So this is doing nothing. And this is also we're going to skip here. And here we just do some uh, rescaling. That's it. Summation, blah, blah, blah. And that's our final reconstruction loss. That's the, the loss there. Uh, now we do the because remember, we return the posterior, which is the uh, Gaussian from the latent space of the audio encoder. And we're just going to compute the KL divergence. So that's going to be the regularizer component. So I'm going to hit F10 here. You can see it's simply computing the KL divergence using the mean information variance and log variance information. Okay, and we end up with a KL loss there. Some rescaling again, and now we enter the, the branch where we train the generator, I assume. Let's see. Okay, all is good so far. Okay, so we pass the reconstructions, which are the fake images, through the discriminator, and we get logits fake, okay? And then what we do is we have a minus, and we do a mean across those weights. So let me show you the shape. As I, as I told you, that's a special discriminator. That's like a patch based discriminator. So that means that the shape is going to be maybe I think it's 32 times 32 or something. So let me see that. So it's 30 30. So that's how many patches we have. And we just do a mean across them. And by putting a minus here, we are literally forcing uh, we will we'll be tweaking the generator weights in such a way such that the discriminator gives a high value, which means it thinks, quote unquote, that those images are real. So again, that's just your 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 GAN standard GAN, GAN stuff. Not nothing nothing super complex there. If you're familiar with GANs, uh, okay. And uh, now there is some adaptive weight calculation. Let me see. Uh, so what's going to happen there? Okay, yeah. So I, I remember this is going to uh, make make sure that we we are weighting the the GAN part of the loss and the reconstruction loss appropriately. Uh, let me show you uh, the paper formula for this one. It's going to make a bit more sense. Okay, guys, here we are. This is the VQ GAN paper. Uh, I showed that in the beginning of the video, and this is basically the formula we're computing. Uh, we are taking the gradients of the reconstruction loss with respect to the last layer of the decoder weights, we divide that by the gradients of the GAN loss with respect to the weights of the last layer of the decoder again. What's the reasoning behind this? The reasoning is the following. If the gradients are super big for the reconstruction loss and they are smaller for the GAN loss, then this is going to be a big number, which is going to, going to put a bigger weight on the GAN loss. So by doing that, we make sure that the network is learning from both losses and that one loss is not uh, overwhelming the other loss uh, when it comes to the contribution to the gradients. So that's the, the rough logic. And you can see um, that that's exactly what we're computing here. So you can see NLL loss, so that's the reconstruction loss of the last layer weights. And that's it, we get the gradients there. Then we compute the gradients for the G loss, which is the GAN loss. That's it. And now we just normalize them. We do the norm. We divide them as well 
and that's it do some clamping blah 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 times some weight and that's it that's the that's that weight okay i'm now gonna return back to the code here uh, now this is gonna be zero for the initial 50,000 iterations or something uh, the reason being they don't want to they first want to train the autoencoder and ignore the, the the gain loss such that they can form some representations and for the stability sake and only then slowly start using the gain loss so let me let me show you what I mean by that let me enter here you can see that until we pass the global threshold so I'm gonna enter here uh, you'll see that the weight will be zero. So the weight will be set to zero until the global step uh, crosses some certain threshold. And because of that, this is zero. And you can see it's used here. So that means this thing is kind of toggled off for the good portion of the, of, the, of, the, of the beginning of the training. So that means we only use the KL uh, regu regularizer loss here, and we use the reconstruction loss here as the final loss. That's it. I know this was a mouthful, but like hopefully it makes sense. Uh, now we just do some blah, blah, blah accumulation of those and we return back the loss and that's it. We do some logging, we return the autoencoder loss and that's it. Now we're gonna hit the training step again. This time we're going to be training not the generator, but instead we are going to be training the discriminator. Let's see how that's gonna look like. Again, uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to skip across these steps. I'm gonna do uh, basically run, disable breakpoints. We're gonna do a forward pass again. Uh, this is kind of suboptimal. They, there, there must be some way to optimize this such that we don't have to do, because we are basically sending the same images here again. Uh, and that doesn't make much sense. And now, let, let, me, let me return, let me enable back all the breakpoints. Now we enter this, this branch here, okay? So again, we have a loss here. All of the inputs are the same. Uh, what's different is that, um, let me just enter here. So we're gonna have the same parts here, reconstruction loss, everything else remains the same. So the interesting part that we care about is here. So we wanna go here. So I'm gonna disable breakpoints, enable just this one, hit F5, and we enter this branch this time. Okay, so here we are. Now we pass the inputs to discriminator to get the real images, and we pass the reconstructions to get the fake images, the largest of the fake images, okay? Again, we just have this uh, factor which is gonna be zero initially, which means this loss will not be uh, enabled in the first part of the training, and later it's gonna gradually kick, kick in. And uh, basically what we do here is a hinge loss between the largest of the real and the fake images, uh, and uh, basically that's it, that's the, that's the gain loss. So this is going to train the discriminator such that the discriminator learns the difference between real and fake images. Consequently, that's gonna lead to better autoencoder because we're we are losing that, we are using that uh, discriminator to train the autoencoder. Guys, that's it. That was the training um, of the autoencoder. Hopefully that was uh, interesting and, uh, and made sense. Uh, now I'm gonna just stop this training because that's pretty much it. Okay, I, I've hit F5 just to show you that now we're just gonna iterate across batches and keep on repeating the same th things we've just seen. So that's why I'm gonna stop this training right now. Uh, we've seen how the autoencoder uh, training looks like. Uh, I'm gonna show you quickly the formulas from the VQGAM paper just to, to consolidate the knowledge here and then we're gonna step into understanding how the diffusion, the unit model is being trained. Okay guys, quickly uh, coming to the paper. Uh, here are the formulas for the VQGAM paper. So um, originally, how the VQGAM was trained was it had these uh, code books of discrete, uh, basically, vectors. And they had the reconstruction loss component, you can see here, plus uh, th these losses here uh, were called commitment losses and they were used to train the code book uh, and the encoder. Uh, what changed in the VQ again is that they started using, so you can see here, um, they're using, instead of L2 loss, uh, they use a perceptual loss and they introduce an adversarial training procedure with a patch-based discriminator. So that's everything we've seen uh, in, so far. And you can see that the final loss looks like this. So there is the, the GAN component weighted by this lambda. We've seen all of these. And there, there is this component here that basically consists out of the reconstruction loss and the perceptual loss. And additionally, in this, um, in the latent diffusion model, they've introduced the KL divergence regularization. So basically, 
Bottom line is the autoencoder used for the LDM paper is a small modification of what they've already done, the same authors in the VQGAM paper. That's it. Let's go back to the code. <clears throat> Wondering uh, for a second about why these losses make sense, even though they are but they are not by any stretch of imagination probably an optimal solution to how we should be training our models. But let's just think about it for a second. So we have the reconstruction loss in the image space and we have the perceptual loss. Those basically make sure that we are we are reconstructing images correctly so that we can we'll learn how to uh, not lose information when we go through the bottleneck part. Okay, then we have the, the, the GAN component, which makes sure that the images look very realistic. So that's additionally kind of enforcing uh, the reconstruction. And finally, we have the KL uh, divergence loss that's just going to be regularizing the, the, the latent space of our autoencoder such that we can later be able to smoothly uh, go through that space and be able to uh, have meaningful uh, representations. So that's the, the basic idea. Like we are, yeah. Okay, having said that, let's go to the long JSON. Let's modify the, 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 the argument such that we are now training, uh, we are now training the um, diffusion part and not the autoencoder. So I'm just gonna remove this part here, uh, remove this space here uh, and paste this back here. So that's everything you need to do. Now we're training the um, diffusion model. So let's go back here. The difference will now be that they are not using with this config, they're not using the same autoencoder. They're using a different one with the with the uh, quantization, but like that doesn't matter. We're gonna focus on, on important parts only. Okay, so I'm gonna um, hit F, hit the training here, and let's start analyzing the code again. I'm gonna focus only on, on instantiating the models and on the training loop, that's it. I'm gonna skip everything else because we've seen all of that. We've seen the, the config as well. So let's just go to the model instantiation. So let's go here. And now let's, uh, let me just make sure that everything is enabled. I think it already is, but yeah. Okay, so here we are, latent diffusion uh, like object. We're starting to instantiate uh, everything we need. So one of those things is gonna be a uh, unit uh, architecture. Okay, so let's start here. Let's see what's going on. We can ignore all of this. So here is the first interesting part. We're going to be initializing the superclass and the superclass is this DDPM, okay? So DDPM is the uh, denoising diffusion probabilistic model. So that's the original diffusion paper that made diffusion kind of practical, okay? So let's enter there. So let's see what's going on there. Okay, so here um, we are predicting, you can see we're running in apps prediction mode, which means we're predicting that uh, noise uh, instead of uh, well, there are some other things you can predict like X zero, uh, et cetera. Okay, we can skip all of this. We can skip all of this. Now there is this diffusion wrapper. Um, and that, that's where we actually start uh, making the unit. So here you can see here, unit model is constructed here. So let's construct the unit. Let's see how it looks like. Uh, again, in some of my previous videos, I've been going through in a lot of detail through how unit is constructed. So you can go through that if you want. Here I'm just gonna kind of quick a scheme. And by the way, I, I love the I love the statements in this in this uh, code base. Fool, you forgot to include the dimension of your cross attention conditioning. Very cool. Yeah, you can you can tell it's a production code. Okay, so let's let's continue here. I think we can skip across all of these details. Um, the, the important parts are these time step embed sequential uh, objects. Uh, what they basically make sure is that uh, we can later pass. Uh, time step information or, or, or uh, conditional information into various submodules. So let me kind of click F12 there, enter the definition. You can see that depending on the layer uh, type, they'll sometimes be passing the conditioning information, sometimes the embedding information, sometimes just the uh, input features, image features, and that's it. So it might be interesting to for me to just show you one small thing and that's the following. So there are these blocks that integrate the conditional information and I think those might be interesting. So here, spatial transformer. So that's the, the module that's going to be integrating the conditional information into the unit. So I'm gonna hit F12 there and I'm just gonna add, I'm just gonna add like a, basically a breakpoint there and let's hit F10, let's continue. Everything else we don't care about really. We can just construct the unit and let's go, to the end here, 
so this is the end of the unit definition quite a long definition definition as you can tell so I'm gonna skip over it and that's it so we're using cross attention to do the conditioning the condition the conditional information integration uh, so yeah Okay, so let's continue here. Okay, that's it, uh, counting the parameters, nothing fancy. We don't care about that as well. That's just the exponential moving average. Um, not, not the fun fundamental part why this model is working. So I'm gonna skip across all of these. Um, now we are re registering the schedule. So this is the important part and I've covered uh, how this exactly works. Like for, I, I've been doing side by side comparison of formulas and uh, of, of, of uh, code. So do check out, I'm gonna link those video cards somewhere here, but the diffusion playlist is the best place to start if you wanna understand a bit better why those work. Otherwise this video would be like five hours long or something. So let me, let me enter here. Uh, let me just show you how this roughly looks like. So you can see here a bunch of those alphas uh, and uh, alpha, like the cumulative products and, and uh, all of those variations of the formulas. Basically nothing is learnable here. Uh, these are just the weights of the scheduler that we need to get diffusion to work. So I'm gonna skip across all of these and that's it. That's an important part, but like something I've covered previously and uh, just a bunch of formulas, you wouldn't get any insights from me going through it. So yeah, uh, I'm gonna skip over that. Okay, we are back in the latent diffusion. So we, we generated the uh, unit, we generated the schedule. Now let's continue and see what else is interesting here. I'm gonna skip across all of these. <clears throat> so because now we are training the, the model in a holistic fashion, we obviously have to instantiate the first stage and by first stage, they mean the autoencoder. So let's again, just briefly go through this one. This time we are forming this VQ model uh, and not the autoencoder KL. So that's a that's a difference. So let's just do that. So here we are. Uh, we are instantiating the, the 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 VQ model. Here we are, and that's gonna call the VQ model here. So let's just kind of start entering there. Okay. So here we are. Um, let's see what's the main difference. We still have the encoder. I'm gonna just toggle off all of the breakpoints. Uh, we have the encoder. We have the decoder. Nothing have changed there. Uh, the only difference is, so we have a loss, which is gonna be identity in this um, uh, this time, because we are not training the autoencoder. We'll just be, we'll be just lo loading the, the pre-trained weights. So let me enable all of the breakpoints and let's uh, enter this part. So let's see what's going on there. Some embeddings, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, it's not blah, blah, blah. Embeddings are actually what's important in this model. So this is a code book. You can see there is 16,384 uh, codebook vectors and each of those has four uh, dimensionality of four and that's what's being used to do the quantizations later in the forward step we'll see how it looks like a bit later okay so that's the quantized part now we have the com layers same as with the autoencoder KL nothing has changed there uh, blah 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 we can skip that we can skip all of this and now we initialize from the pre-trained checkpoint uh, I'm just gonna scheme over all of that. We are just uh, basically doing the initialization of the autoencoder because remember how, 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 how the whole logic works. You first pre-train the autoencoder and then you basically freeze it and you use its latent space and now you train the unit and the conditional model and everything. That's, that's the idea. That's why we are loading the, the weights here. Uh, okay, and that's it. Now we do some uh, set the eval mode uh, and basically now we set the gradients to false everywhere and we can just continue on with the execution here let me hit f5 we exit the condition instantiate the first stage a function and now we instantiate the conditional stage so this time uh let's enter this one uh, i think we are just going to have a class information so you can see here uh class in better is the type of a conditioning model that we'll be instantiating here. So let's enter there. You can see it's simply thousand classes because we are dealing with ImageNet and embedding dimension. And then literally it just does the embedding in the forward pass. That's it. That's how the conditional stage model looks like. Uh, let me remind you uh, what, the, so, so that's basically, um, let me show you the, the diagram here. Uh, that's this part in the image. <clears throat> so this part here is what we've just instantiated and this is the unit. Okay, so we are in the stage two. Okay, let's go back here. 
let me keep on stepping over here and that's it guys now I'm gonna skip across this is the main function again I'm gonna skip everything here uh, I'm gonna also skip the data because that's again just image net and I'm gonna stop at the trainer fit here so hitting F5 waiting for everything to whoops I'm gonna have to disable the breakpoints and only then will this work so disable and just enable this one hit F5 get to trainer fit and then we're gonna start start uh, analyzing how this works <clears throat> okay so enabling the breakpoints um, and we're gonna hit the validation batch as usually okay no actually okay I've, what I've done here is I've added a breakpoint to the configure optimizers this time <clears throat> we're just using Adam uh, W here and uh, nothing else is important I'm gonna skip over this again PyTorch lightning stuff so this is not important here is the validation loader so I'm gonna disable all breakpoints and just end up here hitting F5 we're gonna end up in the training part of the of the training okay here we are I'm gonna step over this and now I'm gonna enable the breakpoints let's just go through this idiosyncratic part again and now we're loading the data okay so we're loading the data everything remains the same we have example that has keys such as images and labels blah 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 I step through that part and we end up in the important part and that's the training step again that's a function that PyTorch Lightning requires you to define uh, you can see that we, we, we have our batch here and uh, everything is the same as when we were training auto encoder so batch image shape you can see it's a 256 256 three channel image okay let's stop start uh, stepping through this shared step that's the first part so we call this get input uh, and uh, I think that's just gonna grab us the okay so it, it, it grabs the back the image so you can see here we just grab the image uh, and we end up with so X shape so we have 256 256 and 3 all of that is as usual uh, now we just push it, push it to the GPU okay so now here's what we do so we encode using the first stage so that means we don't want to deal with images anymore when we're training the diffusion in the LDMs in the latent diffusion models instead we want to deal with the latent space so that's why we call the encode uh, first stage so let's do F10 here here's the encoded first stage and here's what it does it basically calls first stage model it just calls the encode function of that model here is how, how it looks like so it's just going to call the encoder so let's uh, basically let's hit uh, uh, F10 and we are here so we are in the encoder everything remains that's the same as our autoencoder from the first part of the video so we're gonna hit F5 just bunch of com layers res blocks and uh, uh, down sampling stuff so F10 so we end up with representation here so we have now H shape we have 32 32 4 okay 4 is the number of, of latent channels and this is the spatial dimensionality uh, now we do some processing with a com layer and we return back that representation and that's it that's the encoder posterior you can see that the shape here is like this okay so it's not anymore it's not a Gaussian distribution because these types of autoencoder models work a bit differently but the logic is fairly similar so now let's call this get first stage encoding let's see what this is so I'm gonna hit F12 just to see okay so I'm gonna enter here uh, we can see it's not uh, this object so we will we'll not sample from it instead because it's a tensor we simply just map uh, create this type of a uh, variable name binding and we just scale with some uh, constant factor uh, let me see what that number is uh, and how it was defined I'm not sure about it okay so it's one okay so we can we can just ignore all of that so let's continue so now we have our representation so that's the latent representation now because we have conditioning and the conditioning key is I think cross attention or something so no it's cl it's class label but we are gonna integrate using the cross attention logic so let's step over here uh, and what we do is we just pass the batch because the batch contains if you recall bunch of keys and among them it contains the label so that's how they've implemented this basically uh, they pass more data than is needed but we'll see how that's gonna be integrated a bit later so 
let's see what's gonna, going on here. So we just map HC to C. So that's again the batch information. Uh, and uh, then we're gonna skip all of this. And finally, we, we return back. So this is the latent representation and this is the conditioning information. And a bit more stuff because it's the batch information, okay? Uh, and finally, we return back all of that. So that's the first part of the shared step function. Again, recall that we are currently in the latent diffusion model, blah, blah, blah. If I scroll all the way up here, you'll see that, oh my God, oh my God, latent diffusion. Okay, so let's, <laughs> let's go back here. Now we do the forward prop through the uh, diffusion model. So let's see how that looks like, F10. Uh, here we are in the forward prop. Uh, we generate some time steps randomly. Uh, basically, this is gonna be 1000, so we generate randomly the time steps information. And uh, now we do the conditioning. So because this is trainable, we get the learned conditioning. So let's see what's gonna happen there. Uh, basically, uh, we just call the forward pass uh, and we pass C. So C is, as you can see, C is still a batch information. So if I enter inside of the forward function of the class embedder, you can see that we are now gonna extract the key, so the class label from here. So it's gonna be some label of the image, so it's zero. And then we're gonna embed it using the embedding table here. So we're gonna re return some representation that's like what has, should have, however many dimensions this thing had. I think it was 128 or something. So C shape 512, okay. So we return that back, we return that back, we return the C and here we are. So we have the C now. And finally, we pass the image, we pass the, sorry, this is not the image. X should be, wait, what's X? X should be, um, X should be the latent representation, right? Yeah, it is. So we pass the latent representation, we pass the conditioning information, we pass the T, and we compute the losses. So this is basically what we saw here. We are literally randomly sampling like the uh, these uh, latent representations, noise, and time steps. That's it. Let's go back to the VS Code. Okay, so now we have the P losses. This is where the whole magic of the training happens we sample some normal noise. So here we are, so we sample the normal noise. Uh, and then we do the Q sample, so that's gonna do the noising process. So we start from our pure latent uh, representation and we add up T steps of noise on top of it. So we simulate that. If you recall from my previous videos, there is a formula that makes us uh, capable of doing that in a single step uh, by just combining the start, uh, uh, the start representation with the noise and using these um, basically uh, non-learnable parameters from the scheduler. We end up with the noisy version and now we just apply, we pass the noisy, the T and the conditioning. So that's literally, that's literally this formula here. That's literally we are passing uh, ZT, T and C. So let me show you that version here. So you can see that's formula three in the paper, in the LDM paper, we pass these variables here and we are now passing that through the UNet such that we can get a noise uh, as the output, okay? So let's go back to the code. Uh, let's hit F10 and uh, enter the apply model function. So here, what happens is <clears throat> just some variable packing, nothing fundamental there. We just pass, uh, pass that vector that was 512 dimensional. Whoops, I actually have to extract the first because we packed it into a list. Just some details, nothing, yeah, we are passing the same information. So that's the conditional vector. Okay, and here we are. Now we pass, we call the, this should be the UNet. Uh, this should be the UNet, uh, let, me, let me just, if I do type on this object, and VS Code is so nice, I can do this debugging so easily. So diffusion wrapper, which contains the UNet model and the scheduler. Okay, so if I do F10, here we are, we enter the diffusion wrapper, and uh, because we have, conditioning key set to cross attention. We're gonna call diffusion model, pass the conditioning, pass the time steps, pass the latent representation, and this is gonna be automatically handled and integrated via the cross attention. If I click F10, we should be in the forward pass of the UNet model. Let's see whether that's indeed the case. And yeah, you can see here, this is the definition of UNet. We are in the right spot. And so let's now continue. So we just embed the time step information. So now we end up with we do some processing on top of those temporal representations. You can see that 
uh, this is what the dimensionality of the time uh, temporal information now is. Um, okay, and now we start integrating. Now we start literally going through the unit, and you can see here we always pass the representation, the temporal uh, embedding, and the conditioning information. And now that's where the trick comes. So this is where the 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 that special object I mentioned a couple of like 20 minutes ago or something is gonna play uh, come into the picture uh, because it's going to know exactly what to pass. So I'm gonna put a breakpoint here. I'm gonna click F10 and you can see we immediately hit this one. And now depending on what instance is this layer, whether it's a spatial transformer or, or temporal block or just a pure block, it's gonna call one of the three versions of the layer. And that's, that's it. Like now I'm gonna hit F5 and that's gonna hit to the, it's gonna hit the spatial transformer part. Okay, so we hit the spatial transformer, and uh, this is where the contextual information, so the, this should be 512. This is the, yeah, so this is the conditioning information from the label, uh, and you can see that you basically now do simple transformer logic with the conditioning additionally here. So we just pass, you can see here, just some projections, blah, blah, blah. We rearrange our representation such that it's suitable for transformers. So we have batch size, we have sequence size, basically flattening out the height and the width, and we have the number of channels, okay? And now we just pass and do the uh, cross attention with the, um, basically with the um, transformer blocks. So let me do this, and that's it. Guys, that's it. That's it, that's the, um, that's the whole logic. I'm gonna hit F5 again, and I'll have to remove this breakpoint and um, now let's get out of here. Let's get out of this function. Let's just exit this function. Okay, and I'm gonna hit, put a breakpoint here, hit F5. Again, exit this function. And uh, basically, now I'm gonna hit F5 again, and we are exiting the, this is the uh, unit for a pass. We're basically exiting the unit for a pass. And that's it. So let's exit here, and let's see what the output shape is it should be the same as the input latent representation. So it's going to be, whoops, let's let's hit F10. Now we have out, I'm, I'm not sure whether this is going to solve, yeah. So we have the same, you can see the same shape as the input uh, representation we passed, but this is now the prediction. This is now the noise that was put on top of that uh, input uh, latent representation. So again, simply what we've done here, we have a unit model, we pass the input latent representation, we have some time step information, some conditioning information. We use the time step information to noise the input latent. We combine them with the with the conditioning information. We pass all of that through the uh, unit. We do a forward pass and we predict back the noise. And this is where we are at the moment. We have the noise. And uh, let's now see what's gonna, going on. We're gonna return that noise. And here is how the loss is gonna look like in the... Uh, case where we use epsilon prediction as parameterization, you can see that exactly this noise that, that was used to noise the initial representation to get the noisy version is now gonna be the one, the, 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 the variable that we're trying to predict. So that's, that's, that's it, like that's as simple as that. And um, this is just gonna be literally just uh, MSC loss or something like that. So, so yeah, let me just do uh, here. Yeah, it was literally just uh, L2 loss. Nothing, nothing other than that. And that's it, as simple as that. Again, I think this log var is set to zero, so it will not influence, yeah. It will not uh, literally change anything. By doing this, we don't do, we don't change the loss. Uh, and uh, we just now do some weighting, and that's it. Now, I'm not sure why we need the VLB loss, the lower bound loss, because it's gonna be the same computation as what we had up, up there. So look, this thing here, is the same as this thing here. So if I do F11 and enter this, we'll again, we'll again hit the L2 loss branch. So we just compute the L2 loss again and we return that loss. Okay, I'm not sure why we're computing this because it literally gives us the same results. So if I were to print loss simple here, and if I were to print loss VLB, so the variational lower bound, we get the same values and we, we compute literally the same lines here. There is the, the only difference is we have a different weight here for this loss. And um, then because this is zero, this will not even have the impact on the final loss. So it's, that part is kind of confusing. Um, 
and yeah, that's pretty much it. After I do this, there is additionally some some uh, like uh, logic with the um, uh, with Ema here, but um, yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing vital there. Okay, so we can we can skip over all of this, and that's it. And now we just keep on repeating the batch after batch. So that's it. Just a forward pass through the unit, and then. Uh, we basically do L2 loss between the predicted uh, noise versus the noise that we used to noise our input representation. Fairly simple. Uh, literally the formula we saw in the paper just being played out here in the code. So that's this formula here. We are randomly sampling T's noise and uh, conditioning label. Okay, that one is correlated obviously with the image. And then we just use the latent representation of that image. So formula three is everything that we have in the stage two of, of training uh, this system here. After we've done this, we literally can now use the pre-trained weights and start sampling. So let me show you how we can sample uh, using using this, this code. So I'm gonna stop this uh, and uh, let's go to the launch script. And this time we're gonna be using the, uh, the uh, text to image script, this one. And the only argument you have to pass is this PLMS. So that's gonna be the scheduler we are using. You can also use the DDIM, but like uh, this one has higher quality and they showed in the paper that uh, DDIM is just a special case of the PLMS scheduler. Okay, so let's open up the text to image and let's start. Okay guys, let's pick the correct configuration here and I'm gonna hit uh, run and we'll soon start executing the sampling script. So this one is used using a textual prompt, you can now generate the images. And that's that's how these uh, text conditioned image generation models became popular. You, you can kind of tweak the prompts and generate uh, corresponding images. Okay, so here's a here's a prompt I, I'm, I'm currently using, a painting of an AI having an epiphany moment. That's the prompt we're using. You specify the output directory, whether you wanna, this is not important, skipping all of these, a uh, number of, of diffusion steps, that's important. We will be using five in this example, just to make sure this is gonna execute very, very quickly. Uh, I'm gonna store the PLMS so, such that we wanna use that, that scheduler. Uh, this one is also not important. Uh, this is if you wanna have uh, basically always start from the same latent, and that's gonna kinda constrain your outputs to be less diverse uh, as a consequence of that. We don't need that, we don't care about this variable as well. Uh, this is how many images I'm generating, just nine. Uh, the input image dimensions, 512, 512. The latent number of channels is four. Uh, down sampling factor is eight. Uh, number of samples just one, blah, blah, blah. We can skip all of this, there's too many very, oh my God. Okay, so I'm just gonna uh, hit uh, F5 and get here. We can skip this part because uh, it's false. We see everything. We load the configuration. So let's see what that's thing gonna be. Okay, V1 inference. So let me see. So let's go to config. Let's go to config here. Let's go to stable diffusion. V1 inference. This is how that thing looks like. So again, uh, it's literally just going to specify the latent model, specify the unit, specify all the parameters <coughs> of the encoder. <clears throat> pretty much everything and we're gonna be using clip this time not not the class conditional information for the conditioning stage uh, That's it. It's kind of neat that all of this is specified in inside of a config file uh, A couple of things you need to do if you want to follow along first uh, up is you have to go to this um, Like page and download the weights and uh, the best ones are uh, v14 or you can play with v13 as well uh, and basically go ahead download those uh, put them in, in the corresponding directory and uh, that's it. Uh, after that, there is a couple more things. So I had to again, create some um, tweaks. So one of the tweaks is the following. So let's go to latent diffusion. Uh, I'm using this ImageNet uh, config file. I had to specify, so here's where you specify the checkpoint path. So wherever you download, you can see uh, you need to specify the checkpoint path there. Uh, and uh, there is the batch size. I also reduced it from 64 to one. Otherwise I, I'm getting could out of memory uh, exceptions. Uh, okay, so that's one thing. And then uh, you have to also modify this uh, text to image. 
Uh, so basically what I had to do is to uh, set, and this is very dirty, just to make sure that uh, I'm getting this to work on my computer, but there are better ways to, to do this. And it's much better for you to use the diffusers library than to do what I've done here, because they actually have some parts where they accumulate in FP32 instead of doing everything in FP16 as I'm doing. So as a consequence, I'm probably getting a bit lower uh, quality um, images, but it works and I can step through my code. So that's one tweak and then uh, what else? Let me see what I had to change that's important to get this to work. Uh, set the number of samples to one, otherwise with batch size of three, I, I was getting uh, out of memory exceptions as well. Uh, okay, so here's the checkpoint information. Uh, you don't need this part and uh, and finally, I have explicitly made it such that we, we are dealing with uh, float 16 here and not with mixed precision because I, I was getting I was hitting errors, if I recall correctly, if I don't put the FP16 here explicitly. And uh, finally, I've just, for the sake of, uh, of uh, speed, I commented out the check safety uh, functionality that basically checks whether you have uh, uh, not safe for work or, or other uh, problematic content. Okay, having said that, let's go back to the text to image script and we can now continue. That's everything you need to know. Uh, okay, we now load the model. Uh, so we load the diffusion model. Uh, this time, obviously, I'm gonna disable. We've seen all of this. So actually, we're gonna enter this part and I'm only, only going to show you the, uh, the difference and that's uh, loading the clip model. So I'm gonna hit F10 and let's just see how the, 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 the clip model is being used to uh, basically uh, create the conditioning information uh, from the input prompt. Uh, and that's gonna be the only interesting part, okay? So I'm now gonna uh, toggle on all of the breakpoints, hit F10, and uh, here we are. So we are now creating the conditioning stage. Uh, instantiate from config, we have frozen clip and better. So let's hit F10. So here it is. So basically what they do is they use Hugging Face's uh, pre-trained uh, clip tokenizer and, and, and pre-trained uh, text uh, model. Uh, and uh, that's it. Like everything else, I, I've covered clip in one of my previous videos, so I'm gonna link it somewhere here. You can you can go and uh, check it out if you want to understand how clip exactly works. I also covered papers. So yeah, there is a plenty of information about clip on my channel. Um, that's it. I'm gonna leave the for function, the breakpoint there, and let's exit here. And we are done, we are done. We just set the gradients to false because we don't wanna train this. We are now in the sampling stage. So I'm gonna go back to the text to image and I'm just gonna put uh, a breakpoint here. I'm going to basically disable everything and just leave that breakpoint here. Let's exit the, the load model from config function and uh, continue from there. Okay, so pu pushing the model to um, uh, GPU, uh, we instantiate the PLMS sampler. Uh, when it comes to, uh, well, when it comes to init in function, uh, it's not that complicated. We literally just store the uh, LDM model here. So this is gonna be just the, let me show you this. So basically type this is gonna be LDM. So you can see here latent diffusion. Um, and uh, we have thousand uh, steps were used to train the model. That's an important information to form the schedule and schedule is gonna be like a linear schedule. Um, okay, so I'm gonna show you more once we get to the actual forward pass sampling, I mean. Uh, they additionally have this watermark uh, tool that basically makes sure that uh, you, it encodes a watermark that's uh, invisible uh, to, to human eyes uh, basically into the image such that we know that it was machine generated image and later uh, we can use that watermark uh, to exclude those samples from our training data if we decide to do that. Uh, I guess that's one of the main reasons they were, they were doing that as well as to catch someone who is generating images and not giving proper credit to stable diffusion, I assume. Okay, so here's a prompt. We have a painting of an AI having a epiphany moment uh, and uh, we form some output directories, nothing interesting there. Uh, and finally here is, so this is the interesting part. Um, we are gonna start the sampling here. So I'm gonna hit F5, exit that part. And um, here it is. So we, we have a single prompt, so this loop is gonna be kind of trivial. 
Uh, the first part, part we do is we get the learned conditioning from the uh, for the empty prompt. So this is the again a classifier free uh, guidance technique. So because our scale is 7.5, so that's the, the, the guidance scale. That's why we basically entered this part. And now let's, uh, let me just make sure this is all enabled. Let's enter this and let's see how, how a clip works here. So what we do is we encode the prompt and the prompt in this particular case is an empty prompt. Uh, so encoding is just a forward pass uh, through the frozen clip embedder. So we just tokenize the text. You can see here we get batch encodings. Uh, so if I were to, since it's, because it's an empty prompt, uh, it's going to be a fairly trivial. Let's see the shape here. Okay, so it's going to be a trivial encoding. Uh, basically, all of the numbers are the same. Uh, those are the. Um, this is the beginning of sentence token, and these are the end of sentence token. We can uh, kind of validate that by doing the following. So tokenizer, the code I think was the name, and then we just pass. Uh, this number and let's see what it is. So it's start of text and the, the, num the one with ending in seven is the end of text. That's it. That's how the, the, the representation is, uh, the, the, the sequence of IDs is formed. We push them to GPU and we just pass them now to the transformer, uh, which is basically the textual part of the clip model. And we end up with a final representation that's 77, 512 or something. So 77 uh, and six, 768. That's, the, that's the, the final representation that came from clip. And we're gonna use that to condition the unit model. That's the idea. Okay, so let's get back here. Let's get back here. We're returning the information and that's it. So that's gonna be used to condition the unit. Now we do the same thing just with an with a actual prompt. So I'm gonna disable the, the breakpoints here and we do the same thing. So I'm just gonna skip that. Again, C is gonna be same shape as UC. UC standing for uncon uh, basically unconditional conditioning. And finally, here is where the sampling starts. After the sampling, we have a simple, we just pass the, the final latent representation through the decoder, which is just a set of com layers, attention layers, etc., etc., and up sampling, do some clamping, put the, put the final representation onto CPU. Uh, when I say final representation, I mean image, uh, do some permutation, blah, 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 and then we can store the image here. And that's everything. Everything else is kind of arranging the images into, into grids. So this is where the, 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 the gist of the logic is. So in the sample part. So I'm gonna enable all of the breakpoints and let's enter this part. Let's hit F5 and uh, here we are. So we enter the sample part uh, and uh, because we have conditioning, let's see what we do. Uh, we do some error checking there. Uh, we make a schedule. So make a schedule is just gonna um, make sure that we set the appropriate constants. So let me let me kind of go into this. So here, here we are. So first of all, um, Let's see, so we have uh, uniform discretization, number of steps is five, uh, because I said, this is just a dummy. Usually what you wanna use like 50 is okay, uh, 200 if you wanna get a bit better results, but there is a saturating, saturation going on, uh, definitely, so 50 is completely fine. So this is the actual number we use during the training. Uh, that's a vital information for the scheduler so that we can construct the, the, the uh, final, uh, set of time steps. I'm gonna disable these and we're gonna end up, as you can see here, so one, 201, 401, 601, and 801. That means that's how we uniformly sampled our thousand time steps into only five time steps. That's it. Okay, next up we grab the original alphas from our diffusion model here. We create some lambda functions and then as I said, we just uh, start creating these um, non-learnable constants. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna skip across all of these because it's really hard to explain this without taking one hour or something, so yeah. Okay, so finally we, we have those constants in place. We formed our time steps. Now let's enter the um, logic here. So enable all breakpoints. Let's hit F5 and enter this part. So here we are. We are uh, starting to generate the image right now. So here we generate the initial uh, random uh, basically uh, noise tensor, which is gonna be 64, 64, 4, because that's the size of the latent space of this particular LDM. 
uh, and we start there and then we we form the time steps so you can see here 1 2 1 etc etc uh, and uh, we just reverse the time steps here because when we are generating we want to start from the end we're starting from the noise image and we're this time going in reverse until we generate the actual image from our data distribution that we learned okay so running running uh, PLMS sampling with five time steps let's continue there basically we we create the time steps there the first one should be I guess uh, 801 or something so TS801 and then we grab the next ones because the PLMS logic needs it so it's gonna be I guess 601 yep and then let's continue so now we end up uh, doing this we call the P sample PLMS I don't, the code is fairly messy and complicated uh, so yeah I apologize for not being able to explain this a bit more clearly but I'm, I'm giving my best here so <laughs> stick with me uh, so okay let's see how the final logic looks like so I'm setting a breakpoint here we're gonna hit that uh, line a bit later so for now we just uh, grab these constants alphas, uh, sigmas, etc, etc. Uh, I'm also going to put the breakpoint here. So we're going to enter that function. And here is the final logic that the PLMS sampler does. So we get the model output. And uh, that's basically a forward pass through the um, through the unit. So let's let's go there. Let's see what's going on there. So here it is. Um, because we're doing uh, the, uh, the classifier free guidance, we have to repeat our input representation, which is currently just a pure noise, our time steps as well. We have to concatenate both our unconditional conditioning and the conditioning from the actual prompt. We do a forward pass through the unit model. So I'm gonna here just um, disable all breakpoints, do the forward pass, because nothing insightful is happening there. And finally, we get the output representations here, which we then combine. So we combine the noise from the when we when we condition the unit with the unconditional uh, conditioning, and we also pass the uh, uh, basically the information that we got when using the actual conditioning here. And that's that's how we form our our final noise prediction. Okay. After that. <clears throat> so okay, it had to take some time to figure out how, how to connect this code with the formulas from the paper. So let me show you side by side comparison of the code and formulas and let's start and figure out what's going on here. Okay guys, so here is the paper. So I opened up the pseudonumerical methods for diffusion models on manifolds paper. It's a mouthful. Even the title is hard to comprehend. So let's get back to, to this statement here. Oops, let me just find it. Um, basically, so we see four branches here. Uh, and the reason that is, is because they're using this uh, linear multi-step method. And they say here, uh, here we cannot use linear multi-step initially because the linear multi-step method cannot start automatically, which needs at least three previous steps information to generate results. So we use the Runja CUDA method to compute the first three steps results and then use the linear multi-step method to calculate the remaining. Okay, so I've done uh, some annotations here so that we can find the precise formula for each of these branches. So let's start like that. Okay, so maybe I'll start start with the fourth branch. So that's the final step. Once we have uh, had at least three steps of this of this uh, uh, sampling uh, step, basically we'll end up in this uh, hitting this branch every single time. So let's go to formula twelve and let's kind of convince ourselves that this makes sense. Okay, so here is the formula twelve. You can see that the first step is to calculate the epsilon theta. And that's what we've done here uh, in this step. So get model outputs, we get we, we, we have our epsilon, uh, so, so the noise prediction here. The next step is, as you can see here, to calculate this uh, epsilon uh, prime. And you can see it's 1 over 24, blah, 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 some, some, some expression there. You can see that corresponds directly to this one here. So 55 uh, et minus 59. Uh, et minus delta etc etc so you can kind of see this corresponds to this and then there is the third step this phi function which they call i think transfer function uh, or something like that uh, basically here it is defined but we will not use it for for for, for this explanation so let me just get back here so uh, what i've done is uh, basically um, I, I i figure out that this function here which we'll get to in a couple of seconds. Let me enable the. Let me just enable the uh, breakpoints for a second here. So let's enable all of the breakpoints. Let me do this. Uh, so this 
basically a uh, function corresponds to uh, formula eight. So that's this formula here. We're gonna convince ourselves in that in a couple of seconds. Okay, but let me, let me get back here. So we saw that uh, this expression here makes sense. Now let's make sense out of the other branches. So for this one, I could not find the corresponding uh, expression in the paper. So if anyone knows uh, what the heck is going on, feel free to comment down below, I'm listening. Uh, so for, the, uh, for, for this branch here, I found the formula 23 to correspond to this one. So let's, let, me, let me find that one. So 23 is in the appendix of the paper. It's kind of hard to, uh, yeah, even find the correspondence between uh, these, let alone have some intuition. And I guess even the authors of this paper don't have the intuition. It's more of a, okay, we associated this differential equation with uh, this diffusion process, and we just then can automatically pick up the tools that we already have from our long and rich history of solving differential equations and apply those to solve uh, diffusion. But like intuition wise, I'm not sure anyone understand what's going on here. Like I might be wrong, but that's, that's my current understanding of the things. Okay, so I said formula 23, here it is. So you can see we calculate epsilon again, and then we have one over half, three epsilon minus epsilon old. And you can see that exact formula here. So we're computing that result here. And then finally, let me go to equation 22. That's the first branch of this, of this complex uh, branching. <laughs> so first on a high level, this, let, let me kind of step uh, uh, over here. So this function here, get x previous and prediction x zero, is calculating whatever phi is. We'll see what it is in a second. So once we have the results, so we have this x prev, then we feed that uh, into the neural network and we again grab the, uh, find the noise. And that corresponds to this, this step here. So whatever is uh, outputted from the second step, we feed it back into our neural network. We feed in the, the t next, as you can see here. So the, that's why we have t plus delta here. And we get back the, the results here, okay? And then finally, we grab those results from this step and we just add them up with the epsilon from the previous step and we divide by two. So that's this part here and we end up with the ET prime. And then after that, uh, we're gonna again call the phi function here. So now I guess it boils down to figuring out what this, what this phi function is. So let's step inside of this function. Let me show you what's going on here. So again, uh, these are just some non-learnable um, expressions. I'm gonna skip those. But let me find the formula eight, which directly I found that that one corresponds directly to this uh, to this code here. So let me find that. Um, okay, so formula eight. Here it is. So let's convince ourselves that this makes sense. So here we have x minus square root one minus a t times e t epsilon. So we can see that corresponds to this expression here. We basically have x minus square root one minus this uh, cumulative sum uh, product of uh, alphas. And then we multiply that, as you can see here, with, with the uh, output of, of our neural network. And then we divide all of that by the square root of uh, at here. And that's pretty much this first term. Uh, next up, so that's the first part. Uh, and then we calculate the second part. The second part is, as you can see here, it's computing this part here. So one minus a previous minus sigma squared, square root of all of that times the epsilon. And you can see that's precisely this term here. So let me now continue stepping. Now we calculate the noise. And finally, let's see how all of that is combined together. We have a previous square root. So that's this part times whatever we predicted up there, which was the first term, plus this term here. And then finally, plus the noise. So that's part, this part here. Let me just see what the value of sigma t is and it's zero. Okay, so this, this part will actually be ignored. So as you can see here, this part, the noise, because it's multiplied by sigma t, let me just kind of go into the uh, debug console here. Let's convince ourselves uh, sigma t is zero. And that makes sense because here in the paper, uh, they mention it somewhere, let me just find it that they only care about the case where sigma is equal to zero. Let me just find that one. Okay, I found it, I didn't highlight it initially, so it was hard to find it. So they say here, therefore our work concentrate on the 
uh, case uh, where sigma equals zero. Okay, let me read this for you. So here, sigma controls the ratio of random noise because it's modulating the noise, as you can see here in formula eight. If sigma equals uh, one, equation eight represents the reverse process of DDPMs. So those are the denoising diffusion probabilistic models. So if sigma equals zero, this equation represents the reverse process of DDIMs, okay? And only when sigma equals zero, this equation removes the random item and becomes a discrete form of a certain ODE. Uh, ordinary differ differential equation. Theoretically, the numerical methods that can be used on differential equations with random items are limited. So that's why we want to escape, we want to set sigma to zero because there are a richer set of tools when we are not dealing with that random term. Uh, these authors here have done enough research in this case, empirically they have shown that DDIMs have a better acceleration effect when the number of total steps is relatively small. Therefore, our work concentrates on the case where sigma equals zero. Okay, so guys, that's um, that's pretty much it. I'm, I'm gonna open up the code here. Um, as I said, I cannot provide you with much more intuition than this. So let me uh, kind of step uh, through all of this. I'm gonna set a breakpoint here. Let me remove the, the, disable the breakpoints. Let me enable this one. Let's hit F5 and uh, let's get back to the function. <laughs> okay, guys, so here we are. Uh, we now take that output. We basically uh, sum it up with the last prediction from the network here, divide by two, uh, as per the formulas we saw previously. Uh, next up, we compute the phi function again, and that's it. So we return back the x previous, which is the uh, basically, as well as the noise, which is the uh, next step in the uh, reverse diffusion process. So we are slowly getting to the pure image. And that's pretty much it, I think. We're now going to keep on iterating here. As you can see, we append the epsilon to this, uh, to this array of old epsilons, which is used, if you remember, the four branches. So this is where we collect the old epsilons and then we pass them inside here. And that's it. So if we start, uh, yeah, some circular array logic, uh, callbacks are not important. So I'm gonna skip all of that. And now we just keep on iterating and that's it. So we're gonna have in this particular example, five steps, because that's how I've uh, basically uh, configured it. But like in general, you'll have like 50 steps or 200 steps if you want to have a bit be better, uh, basically quality of the image generation. But I'm going to stop this here. And uh, basically, I'm going to stop it here. And I'm going to finally just show you briefly uh, the, the, the safety function they added that might be interesting to some of you. So let me show you uh, how that functions. Let me just find it. Basically in the text to image here somewhere, uh, we have, okay, here. So here's the check safety function. Basically what happens is once you have generated the image and you've done this clamping, blah, 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 you convert it into a NumPy array, basically you have an image. So now they call this check safety for you. And that check safety function, what it does is calls this safety feature extractor. So let's see what it does. Basically, that's some pre-trained model from Hugging Face Hub. Uh, and then they call this uh, safety checker, uh, which is also basically, as you can see here, uh, some pre-trained model from, from, from uh, Hugging Face. And uh, so what's interesting here is, so they do some uh, checks whether, whether you have a basically not safe for work uh, concept inside of the image. And if so, uh, for that particular image, they load the replacement. And I, and, and I think this one is fairly cool. Uh, so basically what they do in, in, in this repo is they take the image, they load this image here. I'm gonna show you what it is in a second. Basically they're recrawling us. Um, so let's, let's find the assets folder. And then under the assets, we are looking for Rick, and that's gonna be this one. Okay, so they, they basically load this image uh, in case you have uh, not safe for work. Uh, content and they uh, get it back. Now the problem is I was playing with this code base a bit and even though I was not generating anything explicit or anything, I was still getting um, uh, th this, this function being triggered. And so, yeah, it's not perfect, that's, that's the point. So we can see the definition actually, um, I found it on the Indie Diffusers library. Here you can, you can see the um, safety checker, how, how, how all of those functions are, are defined here. And you can see you can kind of go through this if you if you if you care about it, but uh, bottom line is um, I couldn't find how the models were were trained, and I guess that's by design because they don't want you to know how to hack the model. 
Although I don't know whether that's the, the, the best uh, position on, on this topic, but I guess it's very uh, highly debatable. So yeah, you can kind of go through this uh, code and uh, basically explore it at your own pace if curious. Guys, this was a super long video. Uh, like we, we saw a lot of uh, things. We saw how to how to basically train and sample from, from these class of LDMs, uh, latent diffusion models. So we saw how to first train this autoencoder uh, who, who, like whose, weight, uh, whose weights we basically then freeze and use the latent space in the second stage where we train the LDM. So basically the UNET plus the conditioning model. And finally, we saw how to sample from these models. Uh, and you saw, that, you saw that some of the formulas and the connections with differential equations make, make it kind of hard to have a clear intuition. But like, I'm curious to know and hear uh, whether and how you understand how diffusion uh, models work. So if you have any intuitive type of an explanation, uh, feel free to comment down below. I'll try and read all of those because I'm super curious. Uh, in any case, uh, if you like this video, share it out, subscribe to this channel. And until next time, bye bye.